Good afternoon. This is Robin Kirby Gatto. Welcome to today. It's going to be an awesome day in the Lord. And as you join on, be expecting. Oh my God, my goodness, my goodness, my gosh, my goodness. It is going to be a powerful day and God is going to show up. We are doing Destiny going into the next session. And I am so super excited as we continue with facing your giants. Amen. Hey, Donna, love you. Thank you for joining in. So good to see you. It is going to be a bountiful day in the Lord. And I'm so excited because it is beautiful outside. It is so beautiful. And oh my goodness, we have got hot water. Thank you, Donna. So good to see you. Thank you for joining in. And as others join in today, if you're not already outside in the beautiful weather, then you can also catch me on YouTube or catch the replay. Hey, Tracy, God bless you. Thank you for joining in. And we will get started very shortly in prayer. Amen. We are in numbers. We are facing the giants. This is destiny. So I will go ahead and enter into this word in prayer. God, we just thank you for truth. We thank you, God, that you have given us Jesus Christ, your son. He is the truth, the way, and the life. And we just bless your name. God, we thank you that you open up our understanding as you flood our heart, the eyes of it, with light, with truth. And bring us knowledge and wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are back to the giants and we are doing destiny. And oh my goodness, this is really going to be powerful. And it is going to so open your eyes as you navigate forward into God's plans and purposes. And what is so interesting is I am seeing so much success and my individual clients who God has me helping them and navigate the wilderness and the course into their destiny. And it is so powerful and satisfying to see their success. And I can only imagine how God feels. If I feel that way and I'm just a coach, a health and wellness coach, I can only imagine. It's just above what we can think or imagine what God must feel and what must be in his person as he sees us run our race. And so we're going to get into the giants overcoming fear because there's going to be so many obstacles. And one of the things that you're going to see is when the identity of good or bad are within the framework of your subconscious, your self image, your soul, which is right here, your person is going to want to forecast a bad report. And we don't want that. We don't want a fear report. We want a God report. Every time I go to the doctor or someone else, I am always praying a God report. I don't want a report of fear. I don't want a report that's bad. I want a God report. Amen. And so we're going to look at understanding God's anger and why it was kindled, why he was so angry about what was going on. And so we're going to look at Numbers 13 briefly, and then we're going to go to Numbers 1, and I'm going to unpack a scripture to show you the potency of what was happening in the supernatural, what was happening in the supernatural so you can get better understanding. So Numbers 13, the last verse that we did, was that verse 26. And it says, They came to Moses and Aaron to all the Israelite congregation in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and brought them word and showed them the land's fruit. And so the stage that this took place, this report the announcement, the broadcast, it took place at Paran Kadesh. And as I mentioned in the last broadcast, that means holy cave, separated, holy, 
set apart sanctuary. And so it would be no different than other radical religions that are anti-Christ coming into God's church and them just broadcasting all their pagan rituals and worship. What is really sad is I've seen some churches close and actually other religions buy that building and turn it into a pagan sanctuary. And that is exactly what it was like with the enemy bringing the report of fear into this stage of God's holy sanctuary. Understand that there is a process that Israel is going through and they're in transition. And so there's so much going on. There's a lot of complexities involved. But the main emphasis that we're to look at as this is a temporary sanctuary, a meeting place, a gathering place for the people to be before the Lord God and also for him to give instruction. Where do we see this throughout scripture? We see this when Moses went to meet God over the mercy seat and that God gave Moses instruction over the mercy seat. Understand that when the power of God is present, all flesh has to bow. And for some reason, and God, please do not let it be me in Jesus' name. Do not let it be my flesh. But this just grieves me so much right at this moment of all of these pictures of different couples where people are calling them power couples. And I understand that that terminology started really in the secular arena, sorry, I'm trying to get comfortable. In the secular arena with motivational speaking, and I just think about it and what it does, and it just spotlights the couple, <clears throat> and it puts so much upon them where pride can come in their members. And although we might think that this was not what the 10 spies were doing in Numbers 13, when they talked about the giants, they discussed all of this in front of God's people in his own sanctuary, okay? We probably wouldn't think, oh, that they're trying to draw attention to themselves, but fear and pride go hand in hand, okay? They're synonymous as it relates to operating in defense mechanisms. In one of my teachings of the Watchmen series, 1 Samuel 2.8, Can You Handle the Truth? God had me unpack Lucifer's rise and fall. Satan, okay? And what was taking place in the heavenly places in heaven and when Satan was cast out of heaven and it cannot be emphasized enough and I'll be expounding on it even more. I have expounded on it a good bit, a very reasonable bit already in Mindfulness Mind of Christ, but I will be expounding on it more in the next book, which I hope to help have out before the end of summer. The Forbidden Fruit, The Spiritual Disease, to bring in truth about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and what is going on in our person. And so when we see fear within our person, there's room for pride. Why? Well, first and foremost, the stress response is a defense mechanism. It gets you to protect self, and that is just normal. And so, when you're out in a jungle, if you were ever out in a jungle and you saw a lion, immediately your God-given stress response would kick in and you would what? Run. You would preserve self. 
okay? And so that is the normal outcome of fear. It's always self-preservation. And so even though something that we see written, it looks like fear. See, we're seeing it written in the Word. We were not there. But if we would have been in the room, it might have presented itself as pride. And these ten spies are over-speaking God. They're over-speaking Moses. And they're over-speaking Joshua and Caleb. And so they're filled with that pride, which is a false sense of power. And the reason that I grieve when I hear power couple about a husband and wife, I grieve because it just brings so much uh, grandeur to them. And it just is a false sense of power, a false sense of success, because truly, God alone has power. Truly, God alone gives us success. And so, as we enter facing the giants, we're going to look at this entire scene and the interactions, the exchanges that are going on. We're going to see it through a new lens, and we're not going to see it necessarily through fear, although it is. We're going to see it through pride. And then we're going to start by beginning to unpack what's going on in the spiritual realm and why God was so angry when God showed me this, as I did Matthew 11, 11 and 12, as, as I did those scriptures, and I did a particular training, a conference, and hold on one second, let me just make sure. Um, I've got a lot going on. Matthew 12, Matthew 12. Hold on one second. Matthew 11, I was right. <laughs> I was right. I just want to make sure. Matthew 11, 12 and 13, I did that particular conference at the Talladega Speedway, and it was then that I did that particular conference that God showed me what I'm about to share with you and about why he was so angry at what was going on with a bad report. You're going to find that a bad report is self preservation. It's self-preservation, and you're preserving yourself from being shamed, okay? And we're going to get in deeper because I know that might be difficult to understand, but you're really agreeing with the bad report because you feel like you don't want to be put to shame if things don't work out in a God way, a good way, in your opinion, okay? And I address this and just be the self-image journal as it relates to people asking why do bad things happen to good people and the reason that people ask that is because they're still in that false identity of good or bad and so their lens is to see everything through that identity and you have to be purged the word prune comes from katharos in greek and it means to purge. It means to purgate, to make clear, to cleanse, to make clean. And so, as we face our giants, we have to look at this in an honest review and consider the root issue that is truly taking place. And that root issue is pride. So, let's look at Numbers 152. And then we'll go back to Numbers 13, and we'll return to the story of the 12 spies where the 10 are given the bad report, and only two have a God report. And we're going to look at pride within our members that would want to preserve self. And you might be saying, Robin, 
No, I don't ever agree with a bad report. Well, I would say, yeah, you don't want to agree with a bad report, but you can speak it all day long with your mouth. And if your heart is somewhere else, you're going to be in that place of agreeing with the enemy. And you're going to totally give in to temptation. And I will share with you when I went to have my breast surgery and the lumpectomy done a couple, almost, almost two years ago, I was wanting a God report. But also, hey, Jennifer, message me and I'll get my teachings to you. I'm also on YouTube. And I'm also, on, I got my teachings on Amazon. Mindfulness, Mind of Christ is the best one out right now. But you have to understand. I mean, I just want to weep with what God has shown me. And I didn't mention to people that I was doing a fast. But I came out of a fast recently, a pretty lengthy one. And what he did to me in that fast cut me so deep that I saw clearly through the lens of the knowledge of Christ how the knowledge of the tree of evil, good and evil, was operative in my identity. But let's just take, for example, my surgery, the lumpectomy. Yes, I wanted a God report. But I was afraid. And I had publicly put it out on Facebook. I was believing a God report. But I'll be transparent. And that's why God uses me so much. Because of my humanity. My frailty. And my realness. You know, part of me would want to preserve myself. Well, what if it doesn't happen the way that I think? I'm going to look really foolish and oh, you know, there is that preservation within our members. No matter what you think, it's there on every level, on every floor. You take the elevator within your subconscious. You go to every floor in your subconscious and you're going to open it up. And there is going to be a measure of pride within your members and so the knowledge of Christ confronts that. The knowledge of Christ confronts all of those issues of the pride of life. It is the biggest issue. And so we're going to start looking at it today in a greater perspective. And the best weapon in your arsenal, the best weapon, weapon is humility and that is why it is so important to fast and pray because you have to have a confrontation with you and God not where you're examining yourself with your own knowledge but where you are so to the foot of the cross that it is God putting his finger on these different areas. And he is bringing it before your face. I'll share this. I don't know why God has me sharing all this. Back in 2012, when God cut a woman that had been involved in our ministry, he cut her off. She had the spirit of divination. And she was being divisive. And he cut her off. And she had been away for six months I went through this fast with the Lord and he took me into it God bless Amy he took me into this fast and this was what it was like and this is why I love this couch so much I have had this couch since 1998 and I love this couch and I'm not going to get rid of this couch I've got new fabric for when it needs to get reupholstered but this couch, I've got some memories. And so, in 2012, I was in a week of fasting and prayer. And that whole week, God, 
it was like God held me over the fire of hell. I cannot explain it other than that. And he called it an accounting of the Lord. That's what he called it. And all of a sudden, it was like he was holding me all through the week. We would go through this during the day when Rich was at work. And he would be like holding me over the fires of hell. And he would bring things in front of my eyes of what I had agreed with with that woman. Of what she had spoke. What things had been in my own heart. And it was in my face. And the only other way I can analogize it is this man who died and went to before the Lord. And he went in this kind of courtroom type setting. And he was before the Lord. And Jesus was bringing accounts against the man. And the man was like denying things. And all of a sudden, Jesus brought the witness that was there to witness against the man. And the witness was his own words, his own mouth. Matthew 12 has it right that we will have to give an account for every idle word that we speak. It is very severe okay and that's why it's so important that you not talk bad about other people and you let God get to your heart about how you see others because that's what he was doing to me last week he was or the week before he was getting to my heart the last two weeks and he was showing me every area, putting it before my face. You're looking through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're looking through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You're looking through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I was utterly convicted to the core. And there was such a soberness that he brought to me about the importance to continue to remain humble and the importance to aim at love. Above all, love, love, love. And see others through love. Not that they're not doing something. They are. But you still have to see them through the knowledge of Christ. And not the knowledge of good and evil. And so, this is what we're looking at. That's why I get so grieved when I see couples say, oh, this power couple. And, you know, people have said that about Rich and I. We are not a power couple. We are just a husband and wife. And God has brought me the most awesome husband who absolutely supports the call of God on my life. And Rich says it is his job to keep me from quitting. Okay? He says he knows what his job is. And his father was a pastor, an Episcopal priest. And his mother did that for his dad. And so, we are just a couple in love with Christ. We live a decently modest life. And we seek no titles. We just seek to love each other and to love others and to be the fruits of Christ to one another. That's your aim. That's what you're to do. You really want to face your giants? You do that because it is the antithesis of fear. It is anti-fear. It is 1 John 4.18, that perfect love of God that drives fear out. It casts it out. So let's look at this area of Numbers 152. And we're going to look at what is going on in the invisible realm. What is going on in the supernatural. 
And if we get there, amen, Liz, if we get there, we'll be able to maybe look at some physics and what is going on as it relates to that. And so let's look at Numbers 152 to get this basis. The Israelites shall pitch their tents by their companies, every man by his own camp, and every man by his own tribal standard. Now, let me read that again because you're going, Robin, wait a minute now. What? What? This pitch this tent by the standard? Wait a minute. I thought we were talking about facing the giants. In order to understand what was going on, we have to get the lens of Numbers 152. That This has to be, pretend that this is Numbers 152 because you're seeing Numbers 13 through your natural eyes, okay? But to really capture and be involved in what is going on in Numbers 13 about the giants, we have to put Numbers 152 on. So this lens is Numbers 152. We're going to wear these glasses. The Israelites shall pitch their tents by their companies, every man by his own camp and every man by his own tribal standard. And so, this is the lens, Numbers 152. And it will totally change how you see John the Baptist and preparing the way of the Lord and Christ is there. It just totally changes it once you see everything through this lens. Once you have these lenses, you cannot not see, okay? And so, Israel, as they would get ready because they were nomadic, they would travel Israel had standard barrier, bearers. They had their own canopy, their own flag, their own banner. And there would be a tribal standard bearer that would carry the banner of the tribe. Much like you see in the old movies where armies carried the flags and they would have someone hold the flag in their sole job was to hold the flag for the nation in battle. Well, Israel would send the standard bearers first ahead of all the families that would gather in the different tribes. And so when Israel would go camp, you would have the 12 tribes and they would want to look for, okay, where is my banner? Where's my company? Where's my tribe? And they would look for the banner, and wherever their banner was, they would say, okay, this is our tribe. This is where we're going to be located, so pitch your tent up, okay? And so one thing God taught me, he said, Robin, there is a standard and wherever the standard is, the door will show up. The tent will show up. And I said, okay, God. And he said, do you understand that John the Baptist was a standard? And I went, "Woo! glory to God. Because Jesus said, Jesus said in Matthew 12, of those born of men, yes, Liz, of those born of men, no one is greater than who? John. So, John was the standard. And he had been prepared in the wilderness, anointed by Holy Spirit, called of God to be the messenger that would prepare the way of the Lord, revealed in Malachi 3, verse 1 the little M, not the big M, the little M. And so, John was the standard. And I said, glory to God. Amen. And Jesus said, but he that is least in the kingdom is greater than John, right? God said, Robin, John was the standard. Like in Numbers 52, 
And wherever the standard is, the house, the tent, the door is going to show up. And I went, woo, glory to God. Hallelujah. Jesus is the door to God. He is the door. Amen. And no one goes to God except through the door. And God said, Robin, do you see that the standard went first and the door, Jesus, showed up? And I went, glory to God. Hallelujah. Woo! I want that, Lord. Amen. Don't y'all feel the anointing on that? Well, since God gave me those lenses, he then showed me Numbers 13. And he said, Robin, you have to see this through the lens of Numbers 152 to see what was literally taking place in that cave. The cave of holiness. The sanctuary of holiness. My sanctuary. God's sanctuary. What was happening in his sanctuary where the news, the evil report, the fear report had come into the sanctuary of God and desecrated it and infected everyone there almost except a few what few weren't infected? The humble. Those who feared God, not man. Amen. So let's look at this in the Hebrew, the word standard. Let's look at this standard and see what this is. So the Hebrew word for standard is dagal, and it means flag banner, standard, and it comes from dogal, and it means banners. It means to flaunt. It means conspicuousness. It means, hello, here I am. What? That's why I cannot stand power couple. Because when you say, oh, there's that power couple, there's that power person, you're going, woo, look at me, look at me, look at me, <laughs> woo, you're doing that. People are doing that. I saw the other day where someone put up a picture of them and their husband, and they said, you know, this is the power couple. They were talking about themselves. What? They're talking about themselves, and they're saying this is the power couple. And saints, it just grieves me because all I can see is, woo, look at me, look at me, look at me. And it's all the attention on self, okay, on self. And it is, it totally takes it away from God and his goodness and what he does. So this root word to banner, to standard, means conspicuous and flaunt. Oh my goodness, you could be sitting in a room, that's right, Amy, you could be sitting in a room, y'all all know what I'm talking about, you women, and you could be sitting there with your husband, and it's not just women that do this, it's also men, but there's this one certain woman that walks in the room and people know that that woman is flaunting herself. And it's because of her own insecurity that identity of good or bad is within her person. And fear has gripped her to some regard. And so that pride comes out in that flaunt. Okay? And, you know, it makes me sad that a woman would even do that because it's all based on insecurity but men do it as well they flaunt themselves and so that's what was really going on in numbers 13 it wasn't these 10 spies going "Ooh, we're afraid we're afraid we're afraid they were flaunting themselves they were trying to be the standard what they were trying 
to be the standard. Why? Because when they went to spy out the land, they got infected with a message of fear and pride. And they wanted to preserve themselves, so they brought that message back into God's sanctuary and they desecrated his sanctuary by bringing the standard of the giants into that sanctuary. So guess what happened? The door showed up. The giants, the fear, pride. It all showed up because those ten spies in the supernatural were carrying the standard of the enemy and brought it into the house of God in front of all of his people, usurped his authority, and proclaimed and announced that message. <coughs> and it infected the people. Let's look at the Hebrew letters that compose standard. It is so potent. So it is Dalet, it is Gamil, and it is Lamed. Dalet is the ancient symbol of a door, and it means to enter and pathway. And then Gamil is something like a camel. It's the ancient symbol of a camel. And in the positive, it means to lift up. But in the negative, it means pride. And then Lamed, it looks like a shepherd's staff with a prick in the curvature. But it's a cattle goad. And it means tongue, control, and authority. And so the word picture in a positive way would be enter the path in which you're lifted up with control and authority of the tongue. Whose tongue? God's tongue. His words. They lift you up. But let's look at the enemy standard, okay? His standard is not lifted up. Remember, the camel also means pride. And so the word picture for that would be enter the pathway where pride is exalted in the tongue and brain and comes against authority and tries to control what listen to that again oh my goodness is god getting all in our business Woo! if people don't feel humbled listening to this they're not going to be humbled Oh my goodness. So listen to this word picture again. If it's the enemy standard. Enter the pathway where pride has exalted itself through the tongue. And it is usurping authority. And it is trying to control. Is that not what was happening in Numbers 13? So let's go back to Numbers 13 and let's begin to look at the response of the ten spies. Here it says, verse 27, They told Moses, We came to the land to which you sent us. It surely flows with milk and honey. This is its fruit. But the people who dwell there are strong, and the cities they are fortified, they're large. Moreover, there were sons of Anak of great stature, which are Anak was like a giant, and courage. Amalek dwells in the land of the south. The Hittite, the Jebusite, the Amorite dwell in the hill country. The Canaanite dwells by the sea and along by the side of the Jordan River. And Caleb quieted the people before Moses. So they are getting all the congregation stirred up. What does this sound like? What God has had me warning people of for a long time. Ministers who major on conspiracy theory. They're bringing the message of fear into God's house. And they're planting the standard of the enemy 
of the giants and the door is opened up for all this spiritual assault to come against the church. And people wonder why these ministers are dying and their congregation is having such heavy warfare. Read Isaiah 8, 11 through 15 and understand that it is God's grace to take some of those ministers out because they've infected his sanctuary and they've brought the message of fear and pride. So let's look at this further. Caleb quieted, verse 30, before the people before Moses and said, Let us go up and possess it. We are able to conquer it. But his fellow scouts said, We are not able to go up against the people of Canaan, for they are stronger than we. So they brought the Israelites an evil report. There it is of the land which they had scouted out saying the land through which we went to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature we saw the Nephilim the giants the sons of Anak who come from giants and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Well, this is the issue. Because God had given an entirely different report. He gave a God report. He wanted them to have great success. And he wanted them to overcome the giants. Do you understand in your destiny, this issue in your heart is going to be dealt with. If you're going to agree with the God report or if you're going to agree with the evil report. And I would tell you <clears throat> more times than not, just because of how deep and the need to be pruned of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil within our members, you will find yourself doing things you wouldn't expect. And you would say, Robin, I don't believe that. Well, let's look at Luke twenty two thirty one, where Jesus told Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked permission to sift all of you like grain, but I have already prayed for you that when you return, you will strengthen your brethren. And what happened before that? Simon said, Prod, I will go with you to prison. I will go with you to whatever, Jesus. I will go with you, Jesus. But what happened when Jesus was taken before the Sanhedrin, before the Pharisees, what happened? A young lady was saying that Peter was his disciple. So here comes self-preservation. Oh, I don't know him. Him? I don't know him. Right? Oh, well, here it comes again. No, I don't know him. Self-preservation. Okay. So Jesus knew what was in Peter because Jesus knows the hearts of all people. And so Peter was sifted. And what he thought he wouldn't do he did. Saints, I'm telling you, there is a deeper cutting within our members by the Spirit of the Lord with the Word of Truth, Hebrews 4.12, to get to our intents and motives because we don't realize how much through the day we're preserving self and we're displacing that were good or bad onto other people or circumstances because we have a log in our eye and we see through that lens and we're not seeing through the lens of Christ, okay? And as I get ready to end, I'll just share the testimony 
of my testimony where God was working on me, and I shared just a snippet of it in the new journal, Just Be, at the very end. And like I mentioned last week, as God had me fast the whole week, he knew that things were going to happen, okay? He told me Monday, he said, Robin, I want you to fast. You, you need to fast. And I was like, okay, God. And the time that I heard that before to this measure was right before my son Christopher went into the hospital at 14 years old back in 2003, something like that, where he almost died. And he wasn't sick yet, but God had called me to a fast and asked Rich to fast with me. And I would stand over my son's bed at nighttime because he would say, go pray over Christopher. And I would just stand there with my hands up in the air just praying over Christopher. And it was to a measure of that urgency, okay? It was to a measure of that urgency. And so God said, Robin, you need to fast. I didn't know why. I just obeyed. And God knew why. And I'm going to get to some measure of it. And so things were happening that were causing me anguish. Okay? And it was deep. And I was heartbroken. Big time. And so I was taking it before the Lord and giving my heart to Him like Hannah <laughs> and just at a place to where I, could, I did not know what to do and I could not speak. And it was coming up from my members, okay? And it had gripped me. And so then things happened and God said, Robin, pour your heart out to this person right here. And I just sobbed and went into counsel with people that care very deeply for me. <laughs> I'll just say that. That are that have known me my whole life. Okay. <laughs> and I just was at a place I needed prayer. And things just evolved out of this conversation. And things that I did not know were taking place that week. I was informed. And I was like, oh, really? That's happening? And I know this is probably, you're probably like, what, what are you talking about? You'll get to a measure of it in a minute. <clears throat> and I said... Well, this is a God thing because I did not know these meetings were taking place this week. I had no clue. And I just know that God is going to intervene on my behalf where I am. The enemy is making me look wrong. And the enemy's accusing me. And I'm just going to trust you, God. Because I can't do anything about it. I can't do anything about it. And so a couple of things. All through the week, as it relates to the anguish I had, God began to put his finger on my heart. And he said, do you see these people, this circumstance, these people, that, that person? <clears throat> and he just began to deal with me. And he said, Robin... Anytime your heart wants to defend itself, it is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you're going to displace badness onto the other person, onto another circumstance, and you're doing the enemy's work. And it was as though <clears throat> I had just been like a, a big bandage over a sore. It had just been ripped off, okay? <clears throat> and I was like, oh my goodness. And then the enemy, of course, would come to me at nighttime and try to make me have bad feelings towards others and begin to say 
things that would be negative and I would say no in Jesus name that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and I will not agree with you Satan I will not agree with you adversary and I will not accuse any one no one I will accuse no one that is not my job that is Jesus's job that is not my job and so God just took that bandage just yanked it off of this wound and showed me all week long all through the day that I was awake in all the circumstances that I was going through just living just living and he would bring a magnifying glass and say Robin that said the tree of knowledge of good and evil that said the tree of knowledge of good and evil that said the tree of knowledge of good and evil you're only gonna have holy thoughts God thoughts God reports a holy report about other people about circumstances and about yourself and God even had me saying and I did this yesterday on a coaching call with an individual client God had me saying Robin you are not bad cuz Satan came up to me in that good or bad identity trying to make me feel bad and I said I am not bad I am not bad hallelujah I am not bad in Jesus name hallelujah and that person's not bad and that person's not bad and that person's not bad in Jesus name and they have the same disease they have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they're trying to displace on me and so God brought meetings that week that only he knew I had no clue he told me who to call what to share my heart about and lo and behold I'm finding out about meetings taking place and I just said this is God and so I said let's pray for this meeting and let's just go in and believe God okay well the night before the meeting or the morning of the meeting I'm waking up right before I wake up I have this dream and I'm just gonna be discreet in the dream I was at this cafeteria in a massive hospital and someone was there that's been in my life they're not as involved in my life thank you God but they're in my life and in the dream there were all these people in this cafeteria and that person had spoken horrifically about me and influenced all of them to think horrible about me and I was just standing there in the cafeteria watching and this other female and a lot of the people that were in the cafeteria were actually the ex-wife okay that's the only way I can explain it this person this man had like in this dream like a hundred ex-wives that's that's the only way I can say it okay and so one of the ex-wives was a doctor that was coming into the room she had a band-aid on her chin and he went up to kiss her to get all this attention to flaunt himself and she turned her cheek and she walked into the cafeteria she climbs up the chair and gets on the table and she starts saying Robin Kirby Gatto is innocent she is amazing she is awesome and she just started proclaiming the righteousness of Christ in me and it just turned the tide well God showed me that that kiss on the cheek was like Judas the kiss of betrayal and that for many years decades okay I have been dealing with this spirit through a specific person for decades that has been betraying me nice to my face but behind my back they might as well get a thousand knives and put it in my back because that's what they've done with the words and God 
in the dream showed me Isaiah 61 7 well sure enough things happened the meeting took place and God said that's the spirit you've been battling against and God broke that spirit last week he broke it where it needed to be broken he broke it and people that had been under that influence of thinking so horrible about me and believing the accuser of false accusations and lies it was broken off of them (laughs) only God knew that's why he had me fasting and then yesterday morning he brought me Exodus 14 13 14 where Moses said no longer Israel that you just stand you just stand and you watch the salvation of God your Lord you watch the salvation of the Lord because the Egyptians who have been fighting you you will never see them again You just hold your peace and you just stay at rest. Do you understand, saints? There is a deeper cutting that God is bringing to our person of humility that we just go low. And God has the battle. God has the victory. All we have to do is stay low. He is the standard. He is the God report. He can overcome giants. He can take down fear. And pride would want me to preserve myself and say to people, do you not realize that I know y'all are talking about me and it's evil? No. Pride would do that. I am to love beyond measure. I am not to accuse I am not to point fingers. That is not my job. My job is to love and to love like Christ. Woo! Because that's our standard. Christ. Christ is our standard that we no longer have to be like the world because we have a higher standard with grace grace has lifted us up and has brought us to a new place of redeemed love reconciling love do you hear this saints what a message of truth and that is what the standard is about in Jesus name God bless you I love you and I will see you next week as we continue on about the God report God bless you I love you